On a quiet Monday night in a darkened office building, Ilva Hagner sat at her desk in the dim glow of her monitor. Several folders lie open before her, papers spread out from corner to corner as she finished up last-minute work. When her boss made her way out, she reminded the 42-year-old to make sure and lock up when she left for the night. That was the last time anyone saw Ilva alive, other than the mysterious person who took her away. 36 hours later, she was reported missing, and the desperate search began. Two days after that, her car was found abandoned outside of a cheap motel less than a mile from her office. The keys dangled from the ignition, the doors were unlocked, and there was no sign of the Swedish national who had come to America in search of a future, and instead became the face of a mystery that endures more than two decades later. Initially, it was believed that Ilva had likely stumbled upon the wrong person, a predator striking out in a crime of opportunity. Friends rallied to try and solve the case, building websites and erecting memorials to a woman who had been such a valued piece of so many lives. Soon, though, many began to wonder if perhaps Ilva's abductor was anything but random and may in fact have been amongst their tight group, perhaps someone who seemingly fought to solve the mystery and bring Ilva home was all along the very person who had been responsible for her disappearance. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 179, The Disappearance of Ilva Hagner. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the mysterious disappearance of 42-year-old Ilva Hagner. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Ilva Hagner was building a future. Settling in Northern California, she picked up work at a budding software company, was pursuing her master's degree at Stanford, and had recently fallen in love. Everything was coming together. But right when Ilva's life seemed on the verge of an exciting new phase, she mysteriously disappeared. This is episode 179, The Disappearance of Ilva Hagner. Jutting westward out from its base near San Jose, a thinning strip of land stretches from the wine country in the south to Silicon Valley in the north, forming the boundary between the Bay and the Pacific Ocean. Locally, they call it the Peninsula, and it's home to 101 cities and more than 7 million residents. In the mid-1990s, as the dot-com boom erupted and the internet exploded into the social lexicon, thousands upon thousands of tech industry hopefuls came to the area from all around the world in search of their shot at fame and fortune. For 42-year-old Ilva Hagner, it wasn't the bustling city streets or the burgeoning computer industry that caught her attention. She was drawn to the hills and trees, the water and sand, the valley and foothills of a place she considered a paradise on earth. It was everything she'd dreamed of, but on one quiet Monday night, it transformed into a nightmare. Ilva Annika Hagner was born on Wednesday, August 4th, 1954 in Stockholm, Sweden to parents Stieg and Edith. Ilva was the firstborn child of the Hagners, though over the next few years she would go on to have two younger brothers, Bjorn and Ulf. Ilva would spend her formative years in Sundsvall, a beautiful city which offers both the fast-paced life of an urban city as well as having many great options for those who love to experience the outdoors, be it hiking, biking, canoeing, or skiing. It's no surprise that, growing up amidst such natural wonders, Ilva developed a love of the outdoors from an early age. As a child, she was enthralled by long hikes through the woods and up the valley. 
This love, no doubt, was not only encouraged but partially inspired by her father, who in addition to owning land encompassing a forest, was a professor with the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. His work didn't stop with teaching, though, as Stieg wrote many papers about that work in Civiculture, which focuses on the growth, structure, and quality of forests, as well as involving the introduction and breeding of new plant life into forest ecosystems. It was more than common for Ilva to accompany her father when he was working, and her lifelong romance with nature was well on its way. From a young age, Ilva was described as honest, compassionate, loving, and highly intelligent. She had a love for language and would go on to become trilingual, mastering English and German beyond her native Swedish. Many have described Ilva as somewhat of a dual soul, harboring both a free-spirited love for life which matched perfectly with her constant desire to be out hiking through nature, but there was also the technical and analytical side where she quickly developed an appreciation and mastery of computer hardware and software. She somehow managed to balance her limitlessly free will with her responsibilities, with many people commenting on how, even as a teenager, she was punctual, reliable, and the type of person who could be depended on to accomplish any task set before her. While Ilva had an indescribable zest for life, she experienced her share of hardships as well. Perhaps the most difficult occurred when she was 17 years old. At the time, Ilva was thinking beyond the borders of her own country, wanting to see more of the world before she settled down in whatever place made her feel most content. However, her dream would have to wait, as in 1971 her mother Edith passed away at the age of 45. A very difficult time in her life, Ilva managed to be a strong pillar of support for her father and brothers. It was also around this time that Ilva's life falls into somewhat of a mystery, as she doesn't resurface in the record books for nearly a decade, and her family has spoken little of her past. In 1980, Ilva was 26 years old and living in Germany. While some sources suggest that during this time she was continuing her education, others have noted that she may only have been on holiday in the country. Either way, while there, she began a romance with an American who was only living in Germany temporarily. Their relationship developed slowly at first, but as time progressed, things began moving faster. Finally, when it was time for the man to return to the United States, he asked Ilva if she would come to America with him, where they could get married. Ilva didn't need a lot of time to think things over as, in addition to being in love, America was on the top of her list of places she wanted to explore and live. Arriving in the United States, Ilva stayed in Illinois with her fiancé. In 1983, at the age of 29, Ilva married for the first and only time. Together, she and her new husband moved to an apartment on East Hyde Park Boulevard in Chicago and would live in the Windy City together for the next few years. In late 1986 or early 87, Ilva and her husband decided to pick up stakes and make a move west to the coast of California, settling in the Santa Barbara area. The couple rented an apartment in nearby Galetta, and for the time, everything seemed to be going perfectly for them. But as the years went on, things changed, and by 1990, Ilva and her husband separated and divorced. Not long after finding herself a single woman again, Ilva decided to move out of the Santa Barbara area traveling 300 miles north to the Bay Area, first settling in Mountain View in Santa Clara County. Here she would enroll as a student at Santa Clara University with her classes primarily focused around marketing. Striking out on her own, Ilva would begin a company called Hagner Marketing. However, this first foray into being her own boss would not go successfully, and in 1995, when Ilva was 40, she had to close down the company and file for bankruptcy. Ilva fell in love with the beauty of California's Bay Area and began spending a lot of time outdoors hiking and camping. Along the way, she made new friends, many of whom were working in Silicon Valley businesses, and in July of 1996, Ilva herself would be hired on by the German-American software company Ixos as their business marketing manager. At the time, Ixos was still a small company with less than 30 employees, but there was a lot of room for growth and Ilva was excited by the possibilities. By this time, she'd moved into a nice home in Palo Alto, which she shared with two roommates. That worked out well for her, as her new job was located in Belmont, just a 20-minute drive north. Not long after beginning work at Ixos, 
Ilva registered for classes at Stanford University. She planned to work during the day and attend night classes where she sought to obtain her master's in liberal arts. Through her job, her enrollment in Stanford, and her highly social lifestyle, Ilva began building a large circle of friends. Among these was Andres Ramos, an executive at a graphics company who would later describe Ilva by saying, quote, She's a typical European who liked the outdoors and was always organizing outings. She's not what you would call a party girl. She was very outgoing, but also very shy and proper, almost a Victorian woman, end quote. Many of Ilva's friends have described her as the person who would break them from their strict routines, mostly spent in front of computer screens dragging them out in the nearby wilderness to get back in touch with nature. According to many, Ilva would take them out camping and discuss business, politics, and art while singing Scandinavian folk songs and telling stories. By this point in her life, Ilva had really nailed the balance she'd been looking for. By day, she was a highly devoted, hardworking marketing manager who was noted as being intelligent and reliable, while by night, She'd hike through the woods with friends who described her lifestyle as free-spirited and bohemian. Inona Gopanath, a close friend of Ilva's, laughed as she remarked that Ilva could easily spend hours just enjoying nature, but once she clocked into work, she'd become, quote, chronically responsible. In the late summer of 1996, Ilva, then 42, met a man named Thomas Pressburger, and there were sparks almost immediately. The two would grow close over the passing weeks, and while she hadn't initially planned on it, Ilva began to realize that the feelings she had were much stronger than she'd thought. Over the holiday weekend of October 12th and 13th, Ilva took Tom camping in Big Sur, a mountainous area in central California, approximately two hours from the busyness of her Palo Alto life. Together, the couple planned to spend the weekend hiking and exploring by day while gazing at the stars by night. She'd later write an email to a friend about the weekend saying she'd had an amazing time and spent almost all of it just smiling and giggling with Tom. During a phone call with Anona that Sunday, Ilva took things further, getting serious when she expressed that she believed she was falling in love. Everything was coming together for the 42-year-old, but she'd never have a chance to see where it could all go. Less than 24 hours after returning from Big Sur, Ilva Hagner would mysteriously vanish. Monday, October 14, 1996 began as normally as any day did for Ilva. She awoke in the morning at her Palo Alto home and hopped in the shower. After eating a small breakfast, she got dressed and began the 20-minute drive north to Ixo Software, which, at the time, was housed in a suite in a state-owned building at 1076th Avenue. Throughout the day, Ilva responded to several emails from friends and business associates and received and made multiple calls. According to co-workers, there didn't appear to be anything out of the ordinary and Ilva was very much her normal, smiling, upbeat self. At the time, she was pulling double duty, carrying out her normal work requirements while also trying to finish up an assignment for a literature class that she was taking at Stanford. At approximately 6 p.m., Anona dialed Ilva's number and she picked up at her desk. Anona invited her out to dinner that night, but Ilva couldn't make it, telling her friend that she was bogged down with work. Instead, the two chatted for several minutes discussing their plans to host a party that Halloween. Since she couldn't make it out to dinner, Ilva instead made plans with Anona to have a couple's dinner the next week, where she'd finally introduce her to Tom. The two ended the call with promises that they'd talk again soon, and Anona never picked up on anything which would have suggested that Ilva was upset, worried, or concerned about anything in particular. The last call coming into the office that Ilva answered that night rang through at 8.01 p.m. According to police records, this call originated from Moffat Airfield, where Tom worked as a software research programmer. According to Tom, The call went well, and he and Ilva were looking forward to getting together once her week slowed down. This call was noted as lasting approximately 15 minutes, and is the last time anyone outside of her office building spoke to her. The final sighting of Ilva took place just over an hour later, at approximately 9.30 p.m. Lori Triple was then the president of Ixo Software, and was preparing to head home for the night. Grabbing her bag, Triple made her way through the office when she caught sight of light glowing in one of the offices. 
Approaching the door, she found Ilva sitting at her desk with several files open and papers spread all over. Working in the tech field, many people don't keep normal hours and instead come in late and work even later, so it wasn't much of a surprise to see a worker like Ilva still going hard hours after her co-workers had gone home. Triple would later tell investigators, quote, I just asked her if she was going to be staying much longer, and she replied that she just wanted to finish something before she went home, end quote. Triple reminded Ilva to make sure she turned out the light and locked up when she left that night, and the 42-year-old confirmed that she'd take care of everything. By the time Triple left the building, it was mostly empty, but for some custodians who worked overnight. The building housed several different businesses, including the administrative offices and detective bureau for the Belmont Police Department, whose door was just 50 feet from Ilva's office. No one knows what exactly happened that night, but we do know Ilva never made it home. The following day, on Tuesday the 15th, was the first time anyone got an indication that something might be wrong. Co-workers arriving that morning noted that Ilva's computer was still powered on and papers were scattered across her desk. This was odd because she was known for being extremely neat and organized. She always turned off her computer and put away everything she was working on before leaving for the night. At the time, no one thought this was reason enough to worry about Ilva, but multiple people would later report it to police as being very out of character. Palo Alto Detective Jim Kaufman would later suggest that Ilva may not have left the office of her own volition, telling the San Francisco Chronicle, quote, She left her desk like she was going away for a minute. This is very uncharacteristic of her. She tells people where she's going, and she leaves notes. End quote. Tuesday would come and go without any sign or communication from Ilva. Friends began growing concerned as the evening arrived, since she was always good about responding to emails and returning calls, but no one heard from her throughout the day or evening hours. Ilva had previously scheduled a meeting with a new prospective roommate for that afternoon. However, when the applicant arrived, Ilva was nowhere to be found. According to police records, Ilva faxed an assignment to a professor at Stanford the night she disappeared, but she never showed up to attend the class. On the morning of Wednesday the 16th, co-workers at Ixos noted that Ilva's desk was still in the same condition they'd found it in the previous day, and more worrisome was the fact that for the second day in a row, she hadn't shown up for work. She missed several business appointments without any notice, and calls to her home went unanswered. Not long before noon, an administrator at Stanford called trying to reach Ilva, but was informed that she hadn't shown up to work. At that time, the administrator notified her boss that she hadn't shown up for school either. After hanging up, at 12 p.m., Lori Triple contacted the Palo Alto police to report the 42-year-old missing. Initially, there appears to have been some jurisdictional confusion, as Ilva lived in Palo Alto but had disappeared from Belmont, so there was a back and forth about who should take the lead on the case. Friends would later report that they felt the issue of jurisdiction caused an unnecessary delay in the beginning of the search for Ilva, though investigators would state they'd begun working almost immediately. And if anything, the more troubling delay was that it took approximately 36 hours for her to be officially reported missing. Initially, investigators went to Ilva's office where they took the missing persons report from her boss and tried to determine whether she was missing due to foul play or if maybe she'd gone off on a trip or was simply skipping out on work for a few days. Co-workers were adamant that Ilva wasn't the type to just go off without notice, calling her very reliable and responsible. Assuming that maybe she was ill or having an issue at home, officers were dispatched to her Second Street house, where they found her roommates hadn't seen Ilva since Monday either. Taking a look around, police located her passport and noted that if she was planning a trip anywhere, it clearly wasn't out of the country. Since Ilva's car was also missing, police issued a be-on-the-lookout order describing her vehicle as a black 1992 Honda Civic CX sports wagon with the license plate 3BBS966. Next, investigators turned to Ilva's financials, though both her bank and credit card company showed there had been no activity since before she'd disappeared. At that time, police had put notices into the system where if there was any new activity, they would be contacted. 
Finally, without any witnesses who had seen Ilva since the night she vanished and with no indication of where she could be, police notified the local media, who ran several reports on television and in the papers describing Ilva and her vehicle. Those reports would pay off less than 24 hours later. On Thursday, the 17th, the Belmont police received a call from an employee at the Days Inn Motel on Spring Street, just out of Belmont and across the line into San Carlos. After reading about Ilva's disappearance in the paper, the employee noticed a vehicle fitting the description of her car had been left abandoned just across from the hotel. Belmont police investigators arrived at the scene shortly after and noted that the car had been left less than half a mile south of the Ixo software building. According to the employee, while he couldn't be 100% certain, he didn't think the car had been there prior to Thursday morning. According to investigators, upon their arrival, they found the car unlocked and the keys were dangling from the ignition. Examination of the vehicle showed there were no engine problems and the gas tank was almost completely filled. There didn't appear to be any signs of a struggle in the car, though investigators did note that Ilva's purse was not located at that time and it hadn't been found at her home either. Realizing that their missing persons investigation was going to be more complicated than they initially believed, the Belmont police placed a call to the FBI to request their assistance. At the time, the Belmont Police Department was rather small, and they didn't have their own crime lab, sophisticated equipment, nor a high supply of seasoned detectives, so they were looking for any additional help they could get. In a press conference held on Friday the 18th, the Belmont Police, along with the Palo Alto Police, notified reporters that they had discovered Ilva's car but had not yet located the missing woman. Asked if they believed that she had been the victim of foul play, investigators stated that, at that time, they hadn't yet found any evidence to confirm that a crime had been committed. So while she was missing, they couldn't be certain if it was voluntary or not. Detective Jim Kaufman noted, however, that there didn't appear to be any indication that Ilva had gone off voluntarily, saying, quote, We put her in the computer, talked to her friends and business associates, looked through her office, her house, checked her email, checked message tapes, all the normal things. We really haven't found anything that would lead us to believe this was a planned event. End quote. On Saturday the 19th, tracking dogs were used in hopes that they might be able to discover where Ilva went after leaving her office. Bloodhounds were brought to the building to try and pick up her scent, and then they were walked to the area where her car had been found, approximately six-tenths of a mile away. Unfortunately, they were never able to zero in on Ilva's scent. Belmont Police Commander Larry Ritchie would later note that they had searched the hotel where Ilva's car had been found, but her name wasn't listed as a registered guest and no employees recognized photos of her. Richie later told the press Democrat that they believed Ilva had likely driven her car away from work that night, but they couldn't be sure when it was left on Spring Street, nor if it was Ilva who had left it there. On Monday the 21st, the FBI officially joined the investigation, sending three agents to work with local police. The Belmont police announced that the FBI would be assisting with interviewing friends and acquaintances of Ilva's, and they would be placed in charge of processing the car for evidence as they had access to more sophisticated equipment in their own lab. At the time, Commander Ritchie would not state if anything of evidentiary value had been located in the vehicle, nor would he say what exactly they were looking for. FBI spokesman George Grotz, however, stated that his agents were equipped to process hair, fiber, and other materials. A public tip line was announced to the media on Monday in hopes that the people who had seen Ilva or her car in the hours after her disappearance might call in. At this point, however, investigators still could not provide any evidence linking Ilva's disappearance to foul play. On Tuesday, the 22nd, the FBI began its forensic analysis of the car, though they told reporters it would take several days for them to process any evidence recovered. The Belmont police reached out to the Department of Justice and requested information on any released sexual predators in the area who may warrant interviewing, while the Department of Corrections was requested to deliver a list of any recent parolees in the area who might merit further investigation. While the media immediately believed this meant some new evidence of foul play had been found, Commander Ritchie noted that it was purely part of procedure and did not suggest that the focus of their investigation had shifted. On Wednesday, the 24th, Ilva's father, Stieg, along with her brothers Bjorn and Ulf, 
arrived in the States and immediately met with investigators to find out the status of the case, only to be informed that now 10 days since Ilva had last been seen, little information had been uncovered. For their part, the FBI completed their forensic sweep of the car and sent their findings to a lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis, though they would not comment on any particular evidence which may have been found. Flyers bearing Ilva's image and description, along with photos of her car, were produced and were being put around town, and while some calls had come into the tip line, there wasn't yet anything to suggest what might have happened. Police announced that local fire departments were called in to assist and had begun searching storm drains and culverts in the area for any sign of Ilva, and Commander Ritchie stated that they'd sent out a nationwide alert to police departments regarding her disappearance. Frustrated with the lack of progress, many of Ilva's friends decided to put their own efforts in and try to find her. Andres Ramos created a website showing half a dozen photos of the 42-year-old, as well as describing the known details of her disappearance. You can see this page in the Vodacast if you're using the app. The link is in the show notes. Marshall Byrne, a computer scientist and friend, told the Chronicle that a psychic had been contacted and was very interested in assisting in the investigation. Robert Collins, a professor at Santa Clara University and a friend of Ilva's, tried to make things optimistic, telling the Chronicle, quote, As far as I know, we have no reason to think that anything bad has happened, but I have no information to think that she's okay. We just don't know. End quote. On Friday the 26th, Ilva's family along with Lori Triple of Ixo Software held a news conference to announce the Bring Ilva Safely Home Reward Fund, offering $5,000 for information leading to her return. For the first time, Stieg answered questions from the media, at which time he said he was trying to remain hopeful that his daughter's disappearance, quote, can be solved in a happy way. We are trying to understand what has happened, end quote. Also present at the press conference was Ilva's new boyfriend, Tom Pressburger, though he didn't speak to reporters, saying he wanted the attention on Ilva's case, not their budding romance. The Belmont police announced that they were organizing several large-scale searches, which would be taking place throughout the weekend, involving multiple law enforcement agencies and volunteers. On Saturday the 27th, more than 30 police officers, reserve officers, and explorer scouts took part in a search which focused on the six-block area between Ilva's office and where her car had been found. The Oakland police sent a helicopter, which was used to photograph the area from above, in hopes that analysis of the images might produce some clues. This search, which was conducted over six hours, included members of the San Mateo County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team, as well as the Foster City, San Carlos, and Belmont Police Departments. Unfortunately, despite the extensive search, no new clues or evidence were found. This was only one half of the bad news investigators received that day, with preliminary reports from the FBI lab showing no forensic evidence had been recovered from the car. No hair, fiber, blood, semen, or fingerprints. Frustrated, Commander Ritchie explained to the San Jose Mercury News that in most cases, you've at least got some indication of what might have happened, saying, quote, That's what's baffling about this case. If there was a struggle in the car, you might have some blood traces, chunks of hair, some sign. We don't have that. End quote. While evidence collection was turning out to be a dead end, Commander Ritchie was positive about the fact that both the tip line and web page set up about the case had been generating new leads, and they were hopeful that through further interviews, they'd be able to uncover something to give them a direction to go. Over the course of the next few days, what little hope Ilva's family had upon arriving in California had faded. Her father, Stieg, explained the decline, saying, quote, As every day goes by, we lose more and more hope that there will be a happy ending for Ilva's sake. End quote. He wasn't alone in this assessment, as a detective from the San Mateo District Attorney's Office told reporters that, while there was a slim chance Ilva was still alive, it was beginning to seem more and more likely that the investigation would ultimately become that of a homicide. In early November, police began going through Ilva's emails more closely and obtained a warrant requesting records of all incoming and outgoing calls from 8 a.m. on the morning of Ilva's disappearance to 8 a.m. the following day. 
These records showed that between 6.16 p.m. and 6.55 p.m., Ilva made five outgoing calls, but the destination was unknown. According to Pacific Bell, any numbers listed on the report as unknown were local calls. While that told police that Ilva had called someone, or perhaps more than one person, locally that night, they were no closer to uncovering who that person actually was. While the calls themselves didn't provide any answers, the paperwork investigators filed in obtaining their warrants suggested a grim possibility. According to the Napa Valley Register, San Carlos Detective Mark Robbins filled out the application for the warrants in which he wrote that a criminal investigation into a suspected felony was underway. They stated that Ilva was believed to be the victim of false imprisonment and investigators fear she is being, quote, prevented by force of violence from making contact with anyone, end quote. Pressed about this, police were unwilling to give any details about information which led them to believe that Ilva's disappearance may have been an abduction or a kidnapping. Commander Ritchie expressed his investigators' frustration, telling the Stanford Daily, quote, We've talked to her boyfriend and ex-boyfriends, looked at all the evidence, and done a complete biographical sketch. In addition to our department, we've also got the FBI, the San Carlos Police Department, and the Palo Alto Police Department investigating this case. This is one of those cases you hate to see because you just don't know what happened. End quote. According to the Belmont Police, at this point, they had officially questioned more than 30 people, but had not uncovered new evidence and had no suspects. On Sunday, November 17th, Ilva's father had spent nearly a month in the States meeting with police and handing out missing persons flyers and was preparing to return to Europe, carrying the heavy burden of believing something terrible must have happened to his daughter. Alongside his sons, they were packing up many of Ilva's belongings. Some they'd place in storage, others would come back with them. Stieg planned to have photos of his daughter and some of her letters beside him for the trip, telling the San Jose Mercury News, quote, this is a very hard struggle to be giving out flyers with a portrait of your daughter on it. It's so unbelievable. I dream of her so much. I dream that she's here, knocking at the door. End quote. In the meantime, detectives stated that the investigation was still active, and they assured the family that they were going to continue using every means available to them to try and find Ilva. Unfortunately, weeks passed and 1996 would end with investigators no closer to finding any answers, let alone any evidence. Months later, in February of 1997, Ilva's brothers returned to California to meet with police and gather up the last of her belongings. On February 3rd, Mountain View resident Sherry Ann Downing vanished on her way to work in Santa Clara County. Investigators began to wonder if it was possible that her and Ilva's disappearances were connected, and the media began reporting about the possibility of a serial abductor operating in the area. However, eight days later on February 11th, Downing's body was found in the trunk of her abandoned car. Her former boyfriend, Wendell Bigelow, was quickly arrested and charged with murder. Ilva's brother Bjorn told the Chronicle that back in Sweden, they'd received a slew of emails from friends of his sister who speculated about the possibility that there might be a connection between the cases. However, investigators looked into that possibility and were quick to dismiss it. Commander Ritchie explained, quote, Detectives have nine binders full of information of Ilva, her boyfriends, her associates, anyone who had anything to do with her. Bigelow's name does not pop up at all. End quote. While this was, for the time, good news, as it didn't connect Ilva to a murderer, there was another mystery brewing which had a lot of people asking questions. The reward money for information about Ilva's whereabouts had been increased to $6,500, but someone had been putting up flyers offering $500 for information. When the number on the flyers was called, it led to a voicemail where callers were asked to leave whatever information they might have. What really upset the family was that the flyers described Ilva as psychologically impaired and went on to say that she may be desperately in need of professional help. While investigators had discovered that Ilva was seeing a therapist and was being treated for depression, her therapist described her as upbeat and doing well. 
There was nothing to indicate that she had any major psychological issues, certainly not to the point that the flyer claimed. The Belmont police told the family they were looking into the flyers and hoping to identify the person or persons who were behind them. Asked about the status of the case, Commander Ritchie told reporters that the Belmont Police Department had used its entire fiscal year's overtime budget pursuing the case, and yet after hundreds of hours of investigation, they still hadn't found any evidence to confirm that Ilva had been the victim of foul play, even though they were heavily leaning towards that likelihood. For her family, even being at home across the world did little to distract their minds from their missing daughter and sister. Soon, their free time was spent trying to look into the case from thousands of miles away, as Bjorn explained, quote, Even if you don't want it, you become sort of an amateur detective. End quote. One month later, on Friday, March 14th, multiple police departments worked together to search a residential area near a nature preserve between Interstate 280 and Skyline Boulevard in the Palo Alto foothills. Searchers brought along bloodhounds, as well as heat-seeking equipment, and conducted the search for six hours a day across four days. Detective Jim Kaufman told reporters that the search was closing in on an area around the 3100 block of Page Mill Road, based on information obtained by an unnamed source. Kaufman wouldn't give more detail, saying, quote, We are searching for evidence. An investigative lead got us here, but I can't tell you why or how. It was good enough to get us up here. End quote. Kaufman noted that they were looking for footprints, tire marks, or any evidence which would show that Ilva had been in that area. It didn't take reporters long to realize a curious connection. Ilva's new boyfriend, Tom Pressburger, had previously lived in one of the homes that was the target of the search, though when asked, he couldn't think of a reason why they'd be looking there. In the end, no evidence nor trace of Ilva was found, though detectives confirmed they had dug in several areas. At that time, investigators wouldn't comment on whether or not Pressburger was being viewed as a suspect. An unnamed source in Ilva's family, however, spoke to the San Jose Mercury News and stated that they didn't think Pressburger was a suspect and that, as far as they knew, police were simply checking all possibilities due to their utter lack of evidence and suspects. Following this search, progress on the investigation once again began to slow down and grow stagnant. On Friday, October 10th, seven months later, the Belmont police held a press conference to update the media on the status of the case. Unfortunately, they had to admit that nearly a year later, they hadn't developed new information in quite a while. They once again noted they still didn't have evidence to connect Ilva's disappearance to foul play, despite the involvement of multiple police departments in the FBI. Detective Mike Speak stated that they'd pursued dozens of leads, including tips called in by no less than 20 psychics from around the world, and all had been to no avail. Speak, however, would not disclose what leads they were currently looking into and wouldn't comment when asked if they currently had anyone under surveillance, saying, quote, that would be tipping our hand, showing our cards and the possible prosecution of people who might be involved. End quote. Tuesday, October 14th marked one year since Ilva mysteriously vanished, and it appeared after all that time the case wasn't even close to being solved. Out of frustration and grief, a group of Ilva's friends organized a gathering, where they planted an oak tree in the Palo Alto Hills adorning it with a plaque dedicated to Ilva. Friend Marshall Byrne explained to the Chronicle, quote, It's hard to hold a memorial service for someone who may still be alive. While we're still not giving up hope, I guess we're holding the ceremony so that we can get some kind of closure. Planting a tree for her seemed to be the natural thing to do. End quote. The tree was planted in a preserve, a favorite place of Ilva's, and notably, it is located close to where investigators had been searching for her in March. A large group of Ilva's friends were present for the ceremony, lighting candles and sharing stories about their experiences with her. A letter from her family was read aloud and said in part, quote, Ilva, you are our beloved daughter and sister. Your absence makes a void in our hearts that can never be replenished. End quote. 
Many of Ilva's friends kept in touch with her family and helped them hire a private investigator to begin digging into the case on their own. Throughout the year that had passed, many began to wonder if maybe the suspect might be among their circle of friends, someone who they trusted, who Ilva may have trusted, and ultimately she had paid the price for that faith. Annalie Strath, a friend, explained, quote, It's pretty scary. You look around at all these people and ask yourself, well, is anybody here guilty? End quote. Interestingly, several pieces of information began pointing towards just such a person. Investigators managed to track down the source of the alternate flyers which had described Ilva as psychologically impaired and in need of professional help. The man behind that was Robert Collins, a professor who had taught at Santa Clara University where Ilva had previously attended. According to multiple reports, their relationship had gone somewhat beyond the classroom, with Collins being described as both a friend and former boyfriend. Asked about the flyers, Collins told the Mercury News that he was following a theory that Ilva may have experienced some kind of psychological issue and may now be living amongst the homeless population. Asked about the wording of the flyers, Collins acknowledged it may be controversial, but he wouldn't comment further than that. Collins had also hired his own private investigator to search for Ilva amongst the homeless, later explaining, quote, I've had over 30 eyewitness reports of people who had seen her in homeless shelters in the first two days I went looking for her. I found three redheaded homeless women, none of whom were Ilva, end quote. Ilva's family was, obviously, concerned about Collins' behavior and began to wonder if maybe he knew more about her disappearance than he was letting on. What police knew, however, is another story, as when asked about potential persons of interest, Detective Speak would only reply, quote, In cases like this, you look at ex-husbands and ex-wives, ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends. Obviously, there are some people we have looked at more than others. Everybody is still being looked at. End quote. Over the course of the next year, the investigation remained open, though there were few developments. Commander Ritchie told reporters that they had conducted digs in a few different locations, though he wouldn't specify where or what led them there. On March 14, 1998, two years after Ilva was last seen alive, Ritchie tried to remain positive, telling the Chronicle, quote, When your trail is cold, it's hard to keep momentum up. We talked to the family to tell them what's going on with the investigation. Any day, something might happen, and it could be solved. End quote. As for her family, however, they had long since relinquished the possibility of a happy ending, with Bjorn saying, quote, Something terrible happened to her, I'm sure of that. We really hope that the truth will come forward and we'll find out what happened to Ilva. There's no hope that she's still alive. Our only hope is to get the killer behind bars. End quote. Whether it was out of frustration or anger or grief or some combination of all, Ilva's family was determined not to let another year pass without addressing their own beliefs about who may have been involved. In December of 1998, they launched a single-page website entitled, What Happened to Our Ilva? While police in the United States had been extremely tight-lipped and protective of evidence and had avoided naming any persons of interest, the Hagner family not only shared previously unreleased information, but they also named the man they were suspicious of. Robert Collins. The website states the following. Prior to the weekend Ilva spent stargazing with Thomas Pressburger, she received several emails from a university professor who considered himself to be her boyfriend. In these emails, he displays a seething anger towards Ilva. He accuses her of being unfriendly to him, refusing to have sex with him, and of being abusive towards him. He writes in one email, quote, I won't forgive you. I have done way too much of that. End quote. He goes on to say that he's extremely serious and earlier in the email warned her about being unfaithful to him. That same week, Ilva confided to a co-worker that the professor was pestering her to move in with him. Ilva told her friend that she was upset by his attempts to get complete control over her, and she also stated that the professor had been making harassing phone calls, hanging up when she answered. 
This friend warned Ilva that most women who come to harm are attacked by men that they know. And while Ilva said she wasn't scared, her friend noted she was clearly upset and troubled by the situation. For six months prior to her disappearance, Ilva had expressed to co-workers and friends that her relationship with the professor was causing a lot of problems. While she saw him only as a friend, he was continually trying to pressure her into having sex with him. Then, on September 23, 1996, just three weeks before her disappearance, Ilva confided to a close friend that the professor was trying to talk her into marrying him. Despite her resistance, the man continued pressuring her, and Ilva said it was making her extremely uncomfortable. As previously mentioned, Ilva's family hired a private investigator to try and determine what became of her, and according to the family's posting on the website, this investigator began digging into Colin's life. The website goes on to say, Investigations into the professor's past have revealed that this kind of unacceptable behavior was not unique to Ilva. In publicly available documents, both his second wife and his daughter have accused him of both psychological and physical abuse. To date, no criminal charges have been filed against the professor. I should note here, while I did look, I wasn't able to find anything showing that his second wife and daughter had accused him of abuse, but this website was put up in 1998, so it may be a matter of time having passed to a point where whatever sites once hosted these documents, they're no longer available. The family's website continues. After Ilva's disappearance, the professor was questioned by police, and he agreed to take a polygraph test. He failed the polygraph, specifically on the questions, did you cause her disappearance, and do you know where she is now? Unfortunately, such test results can't be used in courts in the United States. The professor was, for a time, actively pursuing an unusual search for Ilva among the homeless. His actions and behaviors produced a justified uproar, and his theories about the reason for her disappearance have changed several times. In his own words, quote, she may be psychologically impaired and desperately in need of professional help, end quote. There is no evidence that this was true. Ilva was known as an extremely reliable person, and at the time of her disappearance, she was particularly upbeat. We have politely asked the professor to justify his peculiar search for Ilva. He has responded that he considers that request to be unacceptable. While expressing our indignation over his detestable emails to Ilva, the professor answered Ilva's father by writing that he is, quote, not interested in hearing your delusional ramblings or bizarre theories, end quote. He also told Stieg that he, quote, will not deal with liars or lunatics, end quote. That concludes the family's writing on their website. Now, I think it goes without saying, but I can't verify the information posted there. Investigators have never commented about Robert Collins. They've never shared the details of Ilva's emails and they have not discussed any polygraphs or persons of interest. That being said, Ilva's family would have had access to her emails as her personal computer was amongst the possessions they took back to Sweden with them, and I can't imagine they would want to make this up and risk damaging the investigation for no apparent reason. These details, in conjunction with the known facts of Collins producing the strange missing persons flyers and hiring a private investigator, have certainly been enough that many then, and to this day, believe that Collins must have somehow been involved. Perhaps Ilva's father, Stieg, asked what was, at the time, a general question, though through the lens of this new information becomes more poignant when he said, quote, She had a wonderful weekend, so why would she disappear the next day? End quote. Indeed, Many find it difficult to navigate around the aura of suspicion when the allegedly jealous and infatuated man stresses the importance of not being unfaithful in those emails to a woman who mysteriously vanishes after a lovely weekend with her new boyfriend. Unfortunately, what information is fully known about Ilva's relationship to Collins, the content of her emails, and her private conversations with friends and co-workers has never been revealed by California law enforcement. If you'd like to see the family's website, you can do so in the Vodacast app. The link is in the show notes. Sadly, this is the point at which we come to a rather quick and unceremonious end, 
As 23 years have passed since the last major update by police in 1998, and what few updates have occurred since then were minor, to say the least. In January of 2000, friends and family speaking to reporters were adamant that Ilva would not have gone off without telling someone, and she had no reason to want to disappear or harm herself. She had just enrolled at Stanford, was head over heels for a new man, had a good-paying job, a large group of friends, and had made plans for the future. Police, however, reiterated that they still did not have any actual evidence to show that a crime had occurred. In 2003, Detective Speak was interviewed by KRON News 4. When asked about potential suspects or persons of interest, his answer was fairly vague, where he said only, quote, We looked at three ex-boyfriends. Actually, one current boyfriend at the time who she was seeing, a couple of ex-boyfriends, as well as a number of leads that were called in. End quote. It's now been 25 years since Ilva Hagner mysteriously vanished from her office in Belmont, California. While her case remains open, it has grown cold with few articles or press briefings discussing the investigation since the early 2000s. Primarily, the only time Ilva's name is raised is when human remains are discovered in California and she is listed amongst many other missing people as being a possibility. In each and every instance, the victim has either been identified as someone else or Ilva has been ruled out by dental records or DNA. When last seen, Ilva Annika Hagner was described as being a white female with blue eyes and very long red hair, standing 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighing approximately 110 pounds. Ilva is a Swedish national and speaks with a Swedish accent. Ilva was last seen in the offices of Ixo Software, 1076th Avenue, Suite 200, Belmont, California, at 9.30 p.m. on the night of Monday, October 14, 1996. Her car, a 1992 black Honda Civic with license plate 2BB-S966, was found abandoned on Spring Street and San Carlos four days after her disappearance. At the time she went missing, Ilva was 42 years old, and if alive today, she would be 67. So much time has passed since Ilva was last seen in her office, rushing to finish up some last-minute work. In two and a half decades, not much has changed about the investigation, and little new information has been revealed. Sadly. Ilva's father, Stieg, passed away in 2003, seven years after she vanished. He went to the grave never knowing the truth, never seeing her found, never witnessing someone held responsible for stealing away his daughter and shattering his family. On his tombstone, Ilva's name is etched below his, noting her year of death as 1996. Bjorn and Ulf carry on the family and the pursuit for truth, wondering if they'll live to see the day justice is done, or if they too will go to their graves never learning what became of their brilliant, free-spirited sister whose life was cut down far too early. After an amazing weekend spent camping and stargazing with her new boyfriend, Ilva Hagner returned to her normal schedule. On Monday morning, she got out of bed, headed to the offices of Ixo Software and began her day. She talked to friends, exchanged emails, kept up with clients, arranged appointments, and even found time to finish up her homework. When company president Lori Triple left that night, Ilva was still at her desk trying to finish up some last-minute tasks. What happened after that has been a mystery for 25 years now, and while most believe Ilva is no longer alive, they can't begin to imagine where she may have ended up. According to people who worked at the building at 1076th Avenue, by late evening, most of the offices would be empty. Occasionally, there'd be someone working late, like Ilva was that day. But it wasn't common for anyone to be in the building beyond 10 or 10.30 at night. Outside of Ixo Software, the Belmont police housed their administrative offices and detective bureau just 50 feet from Ilva's office. But no one from the Belmont PD were in the building that night. Outside of a cleaning crew, no one else would have had access. 
Ixo Software's office has its own doors that could be locked, so even if someone were in the building, they couldn't get into the main office where Ilva was. For 25 years, there's been this great debate about what might have happened that night. Ilva always turned off her computer and put away her files before leaving work, but the next morning, everything was still as it had been left when Triple said goodbye the night before. This has led many to believe that Ilva was either forced out of her office or was lured outside by her abductor. Being that her purse has never been located, it would seem that she either left the office with someone she thought she could trust, or she had her purse with her when she was abducted. Several co-workers noted that when the cleaning crew arrived, they'd often prop open doors so that they could transfer garbage easier. Speculation at the time raised the question of whether or not someone may have gained entry to the building through one of those prop doors and had been waiting for Ilva, perhaps, or entered Ixo software before she had time to secure the doors. Strangely, however, no one in the building or the area reported seeing anyone, hearing any raised voices or calls for help, and no witnesses have ever come forward having seen Ilva in her car or anywhere else that night. To this day, no one knows for certain if Ilva left the building of her own volition and was accosted after, or if she was taken out by someone who wouldn't take no for an answer. Investigators focused in on the people closest to Ilva, or the people who had once been the closest. Ex-boyfriends, her ex-husband, her new boyfriend, co-workers and friends... Despite countless hours of interviews and investigation, police were never able to obtain enough evidence to name anyone as a person of interest. Keeping things tight under wraps, little is known about what direction their investigation led them or who may have been considered the person with the highest probability of abducting and likely murdering the 42-year-old. Early on, the case seemed to close in around her new boyfriend, Thomas Pressburger. When police conducted four days' worth of intense searching with heat-seeking equipment and bloodhounds in and around a former residence of Pressburger's, everyone believed this meant they had some reason to think he might have been involved. The problem was, no one who knew Ilva agreed. Friends described Tom as kind, caring, and absolutely devastated by Ilva's disappearance. Even a member of the family said under anonymity that they didn't think Tom was a suspect. After all of that searching... Police didn't find a single piece of evidence to indicate that Ilva had been anywhere near the house, so you have to wonder what led them there in the first place. While investigators wouldn't specify the source of their information, they did define it as having been found through an investigative lead. So it sounds like either someone called in a tip or someone they spoke with during an interview raised the possibility, at least enough for them to think it was worth pursuing. Police certainly think they were going to find something that could break the case open there and committed the time and effort to doing a thorough sweep of the area and the home. However, I think it's worth keeping in mind that this search happened in March of 1997, five and a half months into the investigation. If anyone had thought Tom was involved, you'd think they'd have mentioned it a little sooner. As it turns out, nothing ever was found to connect Tom to Ilva's disappearance. He didn't have a record. There was no history of violence or threatening behavior in his past. He admitted to speaking to Ilva the night she disappeared, and his call was traced to his job at Moffat Airfield, approximately 16 miles to the southeast of Ixo Software. At the time, Tom's work involved NASA's Ames Research Center, and while the military was no longer running the airfield, NASA had tight security measures and kept track of who entered and left the airfield, so police would have known when Tom left work that night. Beyond that, there's never been anything resembling a motive determined as to why Tom would have wanted to do harm to Ilva in the first place. Their relationship was going good. They were both hoping to see it develop into something more. Remember, less than 24 hours earlier, Ilva had confided to her close friend that she was in love with Tom following their weekend trip. According to public records, Tom hadn't lived at the house in the 3100 block of Page Mill Road for a while, and at the time of the searches, the property was owned by someone else who gave authorities permission to search. It doesn't really make a lot of sense that, had Tom been involved, he'd choose a property he'd previously lived at that could be tracked back to him, which is now in the hands of someone else, to potentially imprison or conceal Ilva's body. I do, however, think it's interesting that the search was focused in on these homes wedged in an area right near a nature preserve that Ilva loved to hike in. 
We never heard much more about Tom after the search was completed, and I can't help but wonder if investigators returned to the source of the information that originally led them there to follow up for more details. That being said, in the 25 years that have passed, Tom's gone on to lead a normal life, never finding himself on the wrong side of the law, and he continues to live in California today, in the same area where he was living when Ilva went missing all those years ago. Obviously, a lack of a former or future crimes doesn't clear someone of potential suspicion, but there doesn't appear to be anyone who knew Ilva who believes Tom would have ever harmed her, and no motive or drive to do so has ever been established. Robert Collins, however, may be another story. I'd like to reiterate that I can't validate what Ilva's family posted about her emails and conversations with friends and coworkers on their website. That being said, Acting under the assumption that they wouldn't choose to randomly lie about the investigation into her disappearance, there's certainly enough there to raise a lot of questions. According to them, Ilva had received countless emails from Collins in which he expressed anger and frustration. They claimed he accused her of being cold to him, refusing to have sex with him, and that he threatened her to not be unfaithful. The problem was, according to Ilva's friends, she wasn't in a relationship with him. By what I could find, it seems like at some point Ilva may have had a relationship with the Santa Clara University professor or perhaps had considered one. How long that lasted and how far it went has never been defined by anyone in the public, so it's hard to know all of the details for certain. However, I think it's worth noting that not a single person referred to Collins as Ilva's boyfriend. That was how they referred to Tom. So it seems safe to believe that by the time of her disappearance, while Ilva tried to maintain a friendship with Collins, her interests were not leaning towards romance. Despite this, according to the family, in their email exchanges, Collins behaves as though he is her boyfriend and expresses jealousy and anger about her disinterest in having a relationship with him. There's a lot of different motives out there for someone to abduct, harm, or murder someone. There are, of course, some that are as old as time and come up with much greater frequency. Jealousy and sexual desire are pretty close to the top of the list. Assuming these emails say what we've been told, how could you not take a closer look at Professor Collins? When you add in the flyers that he produced where he claimed Ilva had psychological problems, maybe in need of professional help, and his strange theory that something happened and she merged into the homeless population, things take a strange turn. Factor into that Collins' alleged replies in which he argued he wasn't interested in hearing the family's delusional ramblings or bizarre theories, and for someone who seemed to be highly invested in locating Ilva, he certainly doesn't come across as being interested in treating her family kindly or explaining his own bizarre actions. Just look at the evidence. What logic is there to believing that Ilva in the middle of working late one night somehow ended up in a situation where she had a mental breakdown and decided to live a transient life without telling anyone? Sure, stranger things have happened, but usually there's some kind of a history of psychological issues or some incident that incites a breakdown, and we don't seem to have any of that there. I've often thought about those flyers, the ones offering $500 for information. There's a part of me that wonders if it was just something done on the surface, to make it seem like he was trying to contribute to the efforts to find Ilva. It's certainly a weird way to go about it, and also has an angle of ego to it, as though, while Ilva is the main focus of the mystery, maybe he wanted some attention too. Pure speculation on my part, but it definitely rings of someone trying to insert themselves into the investigation, and maybe overdoing it to the point of being considered highly suspicious behavior. But there is another side that I've considered. Maybe labeling Ilva as suffering from mental health issues and putting out this theory about being homeless served an ulterior motive. It could make people discredit the possibility that she'd been the victim of a crime, leading them to assume she had problems and was likely out there somewhere, but not in any real danger. It distracts from the actual investigation, confuses people, and could also serve as a nice way to catch legitimate tips. Imagine someone saw Ilva that night, maybe with someone else. They see that flyer and call in thinking they're notifying authorities when really they're telling someone who could potentially want to bury any leads that might surface. The whole situation seems to ride the border between criminally genius and sheer lunacy. All I can really say is, 
If someone I cared for was missing, I certainly wouldn't be doing things that might make it harder for the police to find them. I can't confirm whether or not Collins or anyone else related to this case was ever asked to submit to a polygraph examination. Police have never mentioned it, at least nowhere I could find. We all know polygraphs aren't the most reliable source of information, but sometimes just seeing how someone behaves when they're asked to take one can provide a little insight. According to the Hagners, Collins not only took a polygraph but failed it, specifically on two questions. Did you cause her disappearance, and do you know where she is now? While I don't put a lot of weight on polygraphs, if this is all true, it's another disturbing piece of a puzzle representing Collins as the one known person who might have had reason to want to hurt Ilva. Everyone described this woman as loving, kind, sweet, caring, friendly. She made friends everywhere because she was genuinely a good person who made others feel good about themselves. It seems strange to me that someone who seemingly never had a problem with anyone was the same person Collins allegedly accused of being abusive and cold to him in those emails. Also, let's not forget the sex part. Look, if you're the type of person who's going to write angry emails about someone not wanting to have sex with you, I'm probably not going to have a problem believing that you're not completely on the level. It's purely abusive, domineering, and outright acceptable behavior for anyone in any position. If my loved one was missing and I saw emails like that, I would absolutely be looking at the writer as someone who may have been involved, and I don't blame Ilva's family for that at all. According to them, Ilva had been having issues with Collins as far back as six months prior to her disappearance. He wanted her to sleep with him, he wanted her to move in with him, and then he wanted her to marry him. Take a moment to think about that. What type of person not only wants to have sex with someone who isn't attracted to them, but also thinks that if they just keep applying enough pressure, eventually that person will just cave in and marry them? If indeed these emails are the words of Professor Collins, then I think it's quite clear who may be in need of desperate professional help, and it certainly wasn't Ilva Hagner. So in the end, what do we have? A man who had a connection to Ilva, vaguely defined though it may be. He created his own missing persons flyers and conducts his own search, hiring a private investigator to track down some strange theory about Ilva becoming homeless and having psychological problems. He's present at the memorial dedication in October of 1997, one year after her disappearance. He speaks to the media early on in the case, saying there's no evidence she's harmed, but also no evidence she's safe. He's questioned about the flyers and acknowledges that the language he used is controversial though he doesn't want to say much more about it. Instead, he starts talking about the redheaded women he's tracked down at shelters who, shockingly, turn out not to be Ilva. This is all the information that can be verified. Then you've got what the family claims, that he harassed Ilva through emails as well as with hang-up phone calls. According to them, the emails depict a man who is obsessed with Ilva and who believes that she belongs to him. He allegedly threatens her about the risks of being unfaithful and says he won't forgive her. When asked about his behavior, he tells Ilva's family that he won't listen to delusional ramblings or bizarre theories. Yeah, the same guy who thinks that out of the blue, Ilva had a mental breakdown and lost track of her faculties as she blended into the homeless population is saying he won't believe bizarre theories. That makes a lot of sense to me. He allegedly fails a polygraph test, which at least suggests that police looked at him closely enough to think a polygraph was necessary. Ilva supposedly tells friends and co-workers that he's harassing her, that she's upset about it, that she can't get away from him, and that all he wants is to completely control her as though he owned her. Then, after an amazing weekend with her new boyfriend, she disappears less than 24 hours after coming home. Then someone tips off police to search the former property of Thomas Pressburger. Was this done because someone really believed he could have been involved? Or is it possible that the source of that information could have been someone looking to cast suspicion onto Tom in hopes that it would draw curious eyes away from himself? Is it all that really difficult to imagine the seemingly obsessed, jealous, and angry man might have considered her new relationship with this new man the final straw and why not kill two birds with one stone? Everything seems to fit, but if that is the case, why after all this time has nothing more come out? 
if police truly had all this information, in my mind, it's a legitimate cause to at least name someone as a person of interest. But then again, maybe it's like Detective Speak said, and they didn't want to tip their hand without having the evidence they needed to follow through. Unfortunately, it seems, they never got that evidence. I don't know much about Robert Collins. Trying to dig up information beyond the fact that he was a professor at Santa Clara University who taught classes on agribusiness has been a rather fruitless effort on my part despite countless hours searching everywhere I possibly could. All I can really say is something doesn't fit, and the entire possibility just makes my stomach turn inside out. Is that enough to determine someone's guilt or innocence? Surely not. But if I were a detective on this case and I had those emails and statements from friends and coworkers about Ilva's concerns regarding Collins, I know exactly where my investigation would begin. I don't know if Robert Collins is still alive today. I wasn't able to track him much beyond the early 2000s, which either means he passed away or he's been living a life that's kept him mostly off the internet. However, one thing which does come up in every search is anytime Ilva's case is shared on social media somewhere, there's a comment section and multiple people show up to accuse Collins. In at least one instance, a woman addressed it matter-of-factly, simply saying that everyone knows it was Collins who did it. Unfortunately, if indeed he does know something about Ilva's fate, no one has yet found the evidence to prove that. Before wrapping up the theory section, I'd like to take a moment to reach out for answers. If everything the family says about Robert Collins is true and he is in fact still alive out there somewhere, then I'd wager there's a hell of a chance he's going to listen to this episode at some point. That being said, if you are listening, Professor Collins, I'd like to make you an offer. I'd absolutely love the opportunity to interview you about Ilva's disappearance. Maybe you could shine some light on your relationship with her or set me straight about your theories. I imagine a lot of people have accused you of being involved in this crime in the past, and what better way to clear your name than to sit down for a chat about Ilva's disappearance and your thoughts on what may have happened. I mean, you went through all that trouble of creating those flyers. Wouldn't it be nice after 25 years to contribute an hour or two to helping spread awareness of Ilva's case and maybe clear up some of the blind spots? I'm easy to find on social media, and you can always drop me a line at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. So what do you think happened? Was Ilva targeted by someone she knew? Was the motive behind her disappearance driven by anger and jealousy? Or is it possible that it's all coincidental and Ilva's fate came at the hands of an unknown assailant in a random act completely unrelated to anyone else in her life? For now, we simply don't have the answers. 25 years ago, Ilva Hagner mysteriously vanished from her Belmont, California office. In all the time that's passed, the answers have only seemed to drift further and further away. Inside of the first five years of the investigation, it had essentially hit a dead end, and now an entire quarter of a century has passed without the slightest trace of Ilva having been found. Her father, Stieg, went to his grave never knowing the truth, and her brothers fear they might face the same fate. In a case with almost no forensic evidence and no witnesses, the truth can remain elusive for a long time. However, no matter how much time passes, no one whose life was touched by Ilva will ever forget, nor will they let go of their hope that someday she'll be brought home and her killer will find himself spending the rest of his life behind bars. Unfortunately, without someone stepping forward to share what they know, the discovery of new evidence or positive identification of human remains, the disappearance of Ilva Hagner will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Ilva Hagner, the vast majority of it is kept inside of newspaper archives, in which case I would recommend the San Francisco Chronicle San Jose Mercury News, and the San Francisco Examiner, which were most helpful for writing this episode. If you have any information about the disappearance of Ilva Hagner, please contact the Belmont Police Department at 650-595-7400. You could also contact the Palo Alto Police at 650-329-2400. 
1-800-273-1313. Or you could also contact the San Francisco office of the FBI at 415-553-7400. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod. Email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine Anne Bertram Brittany Bivens Christine Greco Krista Colvin Denise Dingsdale Donna Buttram Diane Dyson Eamon Brady Eloan Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen. Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That completes this week's episode examining the investigation into the disappearance of Ilva Hagner. I want to thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.